We have the five hearings. This is our fifth hearing, our last hearing. Uh, we'll be talking about getting uh, your written comments up. Uh, just to let you know that 5 p.m. September 14th is the last day to get in your written comments to us. We do have uh, information on where you can send that in, uh, to. A lot of that stuff has got taken. I know some people have it, and we weren't expecting this month. many people uh, tonight, so uh, uh, we ran out of uh, materials, but we'll, we'll get that information for those who want it. Um, this will eventually go to uh, our Board of Forestry in November, and then to the Environmental Quality Commission in January for approval. If there's any problems between either boards, then whatever is the issue will be taken off and we approve what we both can agree to. This is the DEQ website information. Like I said, it was on a handout that probably was snapped up pretty quickly. And then this is uh, DEQs, and this is Supporting Department of Forestry's website. So, uh, if you want to, afterwards we can uh, get more of that information to you, uh, whether we email it to you or uh, it to you tonight. And finally, uh, we'll be going into the hearing procedure. I will just leave this up for now uh, so you can kind of see what's expected uh, in the hearing process. Uh, our hearing officers have kind of explained it a little bit. They'll explain it some more. But uh, just wanted to uh, keep that up so you can kind of read through that so you can uh, see what you want to do. From here, uh, both Michael and I will uh, take any questions you have regarding the air quality or the uh, smoke management plan part. Michael, you got it? Yeah, just one sec. I want to see how many people we have. I want to make sure we have enough time to answer your questions and also to hear your comments. And that's one of the more important parts of our day. Okay. Got time. So let's start at the front while we're going. Yeah, the question was uh, stakeholders on the on the review committee. Um, let's see if I can get it right next. There's uh, public health advocates. We had OHA. We had the American Lung Association. We had members from the public. We had industrial forest uh, landowners. Uh, we had small woodland landowners. We had federal. Uh, yes, Forest Service was on our committee. Uh, there's actually a website that I could provide after that has a, a list of all the membership and. Comments that they might have provided during the, the committee review, if you'd like to take a look at them too. Okay. Back. What are the alternatives to burning? Uh, question about alternatives to burning. Um, so, so, uh, so we have two different things that we are concerned that can help with um, keeping the air quality clean. One is alternatives to burning. That means that an alternative that we don't light a match to. So we can do things like we can chip biomass, uh, take it off the land to take it to a, a place that it can be a, a biomass for um, fuel and electricity and so forth. Uh, it can be uh, crushed and you know spread spread around. So there's a number of different ways in which we can have alternatives to allow for creating more planting spots or just keeping um, uh, the fuel where it's not necessary to burn it all, uh, but to uh, use another method in which to get it, get at it. Mowing can also be done in some areas. Uh, so there's there's a number of them. I can't think of all of them, but there's, there's that gives you a, kind of a flavor of, of what we do. We also have emission reduction techniques. So in other words, we do light the match, but we do the, the burning more efficiently. Uh, pile burning is more efficient than doing broadcast burning, like a field burn. So you burn the whole area as opposed to just piling up in one area because you create heat concentrations and that more heat, better uh, efficiency of burning. Uh, also putting on polyethylene is another way of a emission reduction technique, as I, as I mentioned before. So that gives you some other uh, ways in which we try to keep uh, our, the efficiency of burning the best. Yes, sir? It seems to me that uh, the major justification for prescribed burning would be, as you already mentioned in your comments, to decrease the incidence of forest fire. What is the evidence that it does that? 
there are studies out there that do talk about that and, and, and how that works. Uh, I would say that the idea is that, um, I can't give you statistics right now, but the idea is that if you burn an area with prescribed burning, that if at a later date, within a few years, you don't want to be too, too long because then fuel builds up again, uh, that if a forest fire goes through that area, then that reduces the uh, amount of fuel that's in that area so the fire lays down much lower and burns at a lower intensity in that area. You can say that forest fire may be much bigger and that it just goes around it and so forth. There's all sorts of arguments you can make on that. But historically, our fires in the past, and the distant past from the time of the pioneers and the Indians and so forth, basically burned at, at a very low level. And that's because fires repeated themselves over and over again every few years. And since uh, the early 1900s, we've been suppressing fires, smoky bear and everything. And we found out that that's not necessarily the best thing. Our forests were meant to burn. That's how they regenerate. That's how they stay healthy. And what we have now is we have large tracts of carpets of green, which looks great, but in reality it makes for a great wildfire, and which is not a good thing. So those are those are some of the things I can mention about the may, wildfire issue. May I just this add something to that? Ashland's been very involved in one of the leading projects to do this, and I can sense that there is a an idea in the room that we go out and, and we start setting off the, the forest using fire to make it safer. Well, that there's a really important intermediate step. The fact that we've been putting out fires for 100 years now has allowed an accumulation, and you could really see it in the Ashland water shed, of all sorts of plant material very thin, sick trees crowding <coughs> out big ponderosas, all that kind of stuff. So the first thing you do in the, the approach that we've been using is you go in and with mechanical means, cutting and yes. chopping and, and pulling out, you get that, that excess stuff which allows the fire to get started to go right up to the crown. That the, the fire, the forests are sort of set up to have really bad fires when they're choked with all that stuff. When you get that material and you get the fuel levels down, then the, it all starts growing back. But it takes, it takes a while to grow back. And we've done scientific studies that show that in the forest, when it was in more balance and wasn't so susceptible to really bad fires, fire would move through the forest, started by one cause or another, sometimes even human beings, so the Native Americans. And it would burn up this at, the, at nearly the ground level but without damaging the duct, it will burn that, that material out. And so you really reduce the chance of getting a serious fire. And you also reduce the chance for us of sources of ignition. We had 100 lightning strikes around Ashland a couple of weeks ago. Sources of ignition getting into the town because Ashland is extremely susceptible Fire. So we're very sensitive about this. The controlled burning is, is used primarily to keep the fuel levels down. Sorry, let him time out to speak to Excuse me? Let, let him finish. We'll, we'll uh, yeah. take more questions. I'm just so, explaining what, what we talked about. Why are we not talking about logging? We're talking about just burning. Well, let me, let me, let me search. Search. So here's the interesting, there's really, there's some, some really interesting aspects of this. When you get that initial bunch of extra fuel out, you have to do something with it. And we've been doing pile burnings. There are technologies that are really better where you burn it at about 2,000 degrees. It makes almost no smoke, and you get biochar. But the terrain is so rugged that we, nobody has developed a way of bringing that in or getting the materials out. But that's something I believe needs to be worked on. The gentleman up here asked, what about logging? In this Ashland Forest Resiliency Project that we did, which is deals with is very sensitive to all kinds of environmental issues. We took out, took to the mills almost six million dollars worth of logs, which incidentally were also very high quality timber. And that helped the economy 
and those things were needed to be removed because they were crowding out other stuff. So there's that is a possibility also in this thinning process of significant amount. I think 3,000 truckloads of logs went through the mountain going to the mills. So that's a little bit more in the details of what we've been It's good detail. Thank you. Yeah, and speaking on what the mayor's saying, um, all the reading I've been doing is saying that there's actually more trees today than there were 100 years ago. Because of the policies, right? When we used to cut the trees down, we plant them. And these, I'm hearing that these trees are planted way too thin. And now we have, this is when less is you know, more. We're crowding out the forest, not allowing the tree to grow bigger and wider. So we have all these little tiny trees growing up here. And 100 years ago, you could ride horseback through the whole entire state. You can't do that now, it's just, it's just way too thick. And there needs to be a compromise where we uh, take this into, into consideration, right? To thin out the forest as part of the plan. Then okay, let's stick with questions. Yeah. Sir. I'd like to speak to that. It's now true that the numbers have been for us here. This is the diary of the Alpha Day Trail in 1846, and they describe uh, dense forests all the way from Tonequal uh, to uh, the California Mountains. And so it was a very difficult time, but the, the amount of uh, uh, underbrush in the forest was just as dense, if not denser then than it is now. Thank you for the comments. I really appreciate the robust dialogue on the issues. We're focusing in on the smoke management plan and we want to answer questions towards that. And then we want to have enough time to answer the comments. That's a great point to raise during the comment session. So questions and we'll continue from the front to the back. I have a question about describing the construct as a forest No, that's what. Not, that's not the smoke management plan. Okay. So the question is, is whether localized burning, backyard burning, that type of burning is part of what we're talking about here? No, it is not. We are talking about forestry management prescribed burning. So. Will there be changes in the current permit season? Uh, burning, I guess, around. around There's no changes to permitting whatsoever. This, that, that's outside of the scope of the smoke management plan. Yeah. I'm curious if all the western states that are affected, which are all of them, have the same process that we're hearing now. Are they going to be following the same rules that you're changing? I can't speak to all the states. Washington is going through the same process. But I can't speak to all the states. Everybody, every state has a little bit different <coughs> smoke management plan and they've got to handle it their way, and I don't have all that information. I have one more question about the county. Is Josephine County the county forestry land that's now in the same way? So did, did the Josephine County forestry land change from the county forestry land that's now in the same way? So did the Josephine County forestry lands have to follow the same rules for prescribed burning? Because I know that we have prescribed burning on this land. Forest managed lands in Josephine County follow the smoke management plan like every other county in the state. What is the difference between a prescribed burning the same thing. Essentially the same thing. Yeah. Prescribed basically means that it is a managed burn. We intentionally light it for management purposes. And that's basically what a control burn is. So far as the West is kind of on fire, and I was told yesterday that California is going to be looking at fires 365 days a year. That could be our future as well. Just wondering how the scope of the control burns can be, on the on a time frame, can be expanded to do more. Is it a question of finances from the federal government? Is it a question of? I mean, I realize you have all the, the facts and the figures, and you need to work within those parameters. But is, is what is holding? What is slowing the process down? We know we need to do this. How can we do it faster, and how can we do it more broad around our state? There are a few limitations, some of which we can control and some which we cannot. Uh, smoke management, 
we can we can change the rules. That's one way we can do it to allow for a greater usage of prescribed burning, which we're proposing. There's also resources, whether it's manpower or money. That is also another limiting factor. And another factor, uh, factor is weather, which we cannot control. So burning has to take place under certain prescriptions of how moist versus how dry it is. So we want to do control burning under uh, the sweet spot where the burning can take place, but it's not too hot and dry, and it's not too wet, so it can actually burn. So, yeah. yes, sir. Two questions. One is, um, where is the U.S. Forest Service? I see Oregon Department, and I see DEQ, but where is the U.S. Forest Service? I mean, this. The U.S. Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management and all federal agencies have to follow the smoke management plan just like state and private. So they, but how are they in terms of control of, of burns? In, in their areas and, and doing the control burns? They are doing the same thing that uh, the others are. In fact, they are probably doing more. They, they have to, their lands oftentimes are, are not as much uh, cut as private lands are, so they have to do what's called underburning within the forest to try to mimic wildfire to reduce the fuels on the ground. And the other question? Just a minute, I, I, I need to go to somebody else. We, we got quite a few, go ahead, man. Um, yes, I was out in Applegate, and we had the board and ownership of the oh, Sorry, I didn't, I can't quite hear you. I was in the So the question is, um, how are we going to increase our communication for landowners about prescribed burning when they might be happening or um, where they might be happening, especially in the checkerboard uh, parts of the state? Well, are you concerned about the landowner or are you concerned about the public who's potentially going to be impacted by the smoke? The landowner is next door to where you're going to do the burning. Well, the landowners in and of themselves are pretty aware of what their neighbors are doing. And that hasn't been really an issue. Uh, it's, it's how much the public knows about the smoke and whether it's an impact to us. So we have not addressed that issue in the smoke management plan. I'll just add that a part of our communication efforts is to reach out to the community, and that includes landowners. So part of our, um, our efforts to increase our communication ability with communities will also cover how we um, communicate with landowners as well. Okay, just a quick question. I appreciate the comment that you work with communities. And um, we have a lot of communities here and your stakeholders in the process. In that, why wouldn't you consider your contributions as an essential stakeholder in your process? I would say that we do consider our county commissions as essential stakeholders in the process, and that's one of the reasons why we had county commissioners present on our stakeholder, on our um, rules advisory committee. Um, and that's also part of the process, the reasons why in this exemption evaluation, Board of Forestry included an evaluation of our, any plans that might happen for an exemption to go through a, a local evaluation to make sure that it aligns with the objectives of your community. So I would say that it is, the DEQ would definitely feel that our commissioners are important stakeholders that we want to work with. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier uh, that you're tracking the smoke and intrusions. Uh, with the current wildfires, we're seeing significant burnout operations. That's just putting up ridiculous particulars. We sit here tonight, it's 218 very unhealthy. So, you said you do this 365 days a year, you track smoke intrusions. How are you tracking the wildfire management and these burnouts they're putting out, which is creating a lot of unhealthy air quality we have right now? What you're asking is really outside of the scope of our business. Wildfire burning is outside of prescribed fire. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying talking to smoke management. Yeah. I know, smoke management for prescribed burning, not for wildfire. So are we playing semantics on that? Because the health effect is the same. Right, so did, you were concerned about wildfire smoke impacts, and we've used uh, this technique of the smoke uh, 
protocols working with the U.S. Border Service, our health authorities, the local county health, health authorities to communicate on impacts that might be coming from wildfire smoke. And you know, it, it's something that's uh, hard to control, right? Wildfires are wildfires for a reason. But there's, some, there's uh, techniques that we can use to communicate with the public on how to protect yourself, when smoke is coming, where it's, uh, where it's coming from, and um, things that you can do to, to take uh, your health, health into consideration, and who you can go to to get uh, more information on how the smoke might, might be impacting you. So we've been uh, working collaboratively with our partners at the Oregon Health Authority, at the Department of Forestry, at the U.S. Forest Service, with the National Weather Service, these, all these agencies, to make sure that we're communicating with the public on how these wildfires well, then let me clarify that question. If you're saying this is a policy and a procedure that has to be followed, how are they being exempted on the wildfires? Do they not have to follow the same policy and procedure? I'm not sure I understand your question. How Come on. <laughs> Answer the question. There's, there's no secret plan with that. We don't have rules on how you fight wildfires. It's basically you're trying to put the fire out. And however you do that, whether it's a burnout operation to fight fire with fire, or you're putting out, we all live in tall water or something like that. We need to put, we're trying to suppress the fire itself. And like I said, wildfire is, is totally different than prescribed burning. Our prescribed burning is trying to reduce the amount of wildfire in a long-term level. But on a short term, we don't have control over wildfire. That's why they are wildfire. So there's no communication between your organizations and the fires, and there's no discussion about the current environmental conditions when they get ready to do a burnout, and if it's appropriate to do it or not for no. smoke management? There is not. That's a big flaw. Not, not a great management. Okay. <laughs> um, the questions you're asking are good questions. This is, but, but where you should be asking them is at the meetings that have been held frequently around here by the people actually doing the firefighting. And to, so they, they've had three or four meetings in Ashland, for example, haven't had a few for a couple of weeks, but those are the people who can explain to you exactly they're doing burnouts for what purposes and what kinds of things they take into consideration. I have asked those questions. Okay, one more question on this side of the aisle, then we'll go over to this side. Yeah. I had hoped to hear how the prescribed burning and the changes that you're making um, would help reduce wildfires and the, the impact and their severity. Is there, do you have statistics or somewhere we can go look and see how if we make these changes we hope the impact will be this with wildfires? While I can't give you specific articles, I would say do a web search on prescribed fire reducing wildfire. You'll, you'll find articles. I mean so. the changes you're proposing now. I was hoping you had something along those lines that we're making these changes and it will have this impact. Yes. So what we're proposing is we, when we change the definition of an intrusion to allow a little bit more uh, prescribed fire smoke into a community or have the ability to do that, we are allowing a greater amount of prescribed burning to take place. So that 165,000 acre number that the last 10 years, we're hoping that that will increase over the next 10 to 15 years that may go up to 300,000 acres. It's going to take time, it's going to be a slow process, but we've got to start somewhere. And that's what we're trying to do. Yes, sir. There's three things that are necessary for a fire. Fuel, uh, air, and heat. We can't do anything about uh, lowering the heat on a short-term basis. We can't control the air but we can take steps to reduce the amount of fuel. Yes. And that's what the yes. 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 Thank you. Ma'am. Yeah, how um, is it being determined which areas will be burned? And who makes that decision? And are, are there, is there any priority? Uh, targets? How do you do that? Very good question. And there are uh, people, whether it's Forest Service, BLM, private land owners, 
who make those decisions. They determine what areas need have the highest priority to get uh, the most fuel off the ground, whether it's uh, using alternatives or burning. And so this is done in on a forest by forest basis. But are you involved in making the decisions? I'm not involved in making those decisions. Well, We're right. involved in giving out the forecast for how much prescribed burning will take place. That's what our job is in the smoke management So, so I, I, like if I have a piece of land, I nominate my, my own land for burning, and you can approve or disapprove? Is that how it's That's done? correct. You you so wouldn't come to me, you would come to, you'd come to your, your local district office to say, I want to uh, use prescribed burning to reduce the fuels on our, on our ground, and then they may, you may have a forester come out and take a look at your situation, uh, you get a permit, and that's that's how you go. And then when you find the right day, then you contact them to get permission to burn on a specific but, day. But if this is a crisis situation, shouldn't we be giving priority to certain areas? And that's what we're trying to do. That's what the foresters are trying to do. There are certain areas near communities, like near to the west of Bend as an example, uh, near the John Day area, Baker City, have priority areas where they're trying to reduce fuels to keep it from going into those towns and also to basically just re reduce the fuel load in those areas. So there is, that, that work is going on. So there's a focus around communities? Mainly, yeah, that's the, that's the key thing. We're trying to uh, uh, basically keep uh, people safe. It's a wildfire risk. So we don't want fire to go through the town. So, so. if you uh, approve a, a burn around um, around a certain community, that right. might mean you can't. We respond to those people who ask where they're doing the burn, okay. sir. It seems to me uh, the the issue here is reducing the fuel load, basically reducing the volume of the understory. Are we looking at all the different variables that contribute to the increase? in the fuel load and understory in the woods and open space around us. Yes, fire ecologists do that all the time. That's their job. Should they now, be in this document? It's, it's not really part of our scope in our program, what we're, uh, our program is about. There are other people who do that. <laughs> Thank you for providing <coughs> for questions and comments. Um, two questions. One, how many weather stations do you have in Southern Oregon that indicate for you the, um, the variables that you look at for igniting prescribed burns? And are there separate weather stations in, say, the Applegate Valley or in the, um, the Smith River versus Medford? And then the second question is, what is the process for your community response plan look like? Um, and what type of, uh, how, would you provide public um, opportunity for comment on that? Okay, so the first question is how many weather stations, and I assume Southwest Oregon? Yes. There are. <clears throat> While I don't have a specific count, I'd say probably in the range of 15 to 20, and it just depends on how far north you want to go. We have a lot of what's called remote automated weather stations that we have that are used for fire danger and for prescribed burning. And so I'd say in Southwest Oregon, Rogue Valley area out to the coast and to the Cascades. I'm guessing 15 at least. And regarding your question on how folks can give us feedback on the community response plans, that's part of the purpose of tonight. You know, we'll have the hearing in, a little, in shortly. Hearing, please give us feedback on how you'd like to see those community response plans put together. What made me think of it was the woman who lives in the Applegate and lives in the ONC checkerboard and would like communication between when a prescribed burn would be near her property and what defensible space she would need to make sure it was established before the agency um, allowed that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, where does ODF get funding to do the prescribed burns and do you do any spinning? Most of our funds come from uh, fees. So we have a 50 cent registration fee for how many acres uh, want, people want to burn, so 50 cents per acre. And then the burn fee can range from 50 cents an acre for landings. I won't try to explain those. Basically, where a lot of material from the logging operation bring up all the logs, and that's where the log trucks take them away. 
And then there's also pile burning and broadcast burning. It's three dollars and ten cents an acre. So yes, we do uh, have fees, and that's and we do have some other contracts that we do uh, weather forecast services for. So that's how our program is funded. So if you can't collect fees from a forested area, you won't go in and do it to start burning that area. In order for somebody to do a prescribed burn, they're going to have to pay a registration fee for how many acres they have. And then when the burn window is available, the first time they light a match to that fire, they're going to charge a burn fee for the number of acres in which they burn. But what about public land? About what? Public land. All lands. The only place that does not get fees, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, are private lands on the east side of the Cascades. Otherwise, federal private lands are all charged this registration fee for forest management prescribed burn. Yeah. Do you use a GIS program to um, describe areas for priorities that will hopefully be burned in the near future that you could share with the public? That's a good question, but uh, I'm not sure if what you're asking is within our scope of our program. Um, we've looked at GIS for forecasting, weather forecasting for prescribed burning, but what the foresters are doing for GIS for, uh, use, for determining um, forestry burning, I'm not sure exactly how much they are doing it. We do have a GIS section in the Department of Forestry, so it is being used for mapping and things like that, for wildfire and mapping different types of terrain and vegetation. How that's used for prescribed fire, I'm not sure. I, I just add that that's a great question, and it would be helpful to put it on the record during the hearing process so that we can get back to you and make sure you respond. Sir. Um, you mentioned a change in how you're going to measure your air quality and stuff. You see the striking of an epilometer. How are you going to measure now? Well, we do have monitors. The difference here um, is instead of monitoring using a light scattering technique, we're going to convert that, that value to a PM value. There's a ratio. So we'll still be using nephilometers and other monitoring equipment that we have set up throughout the state, but it's just the value that we're representing. Um, the the uh, micrograms per cubic meter is the value that we use to reference in the AQI, the air, the air quality index, and that's the tool that we use to communicate about health impacts from smoke and other pollutants with the public. And so it really marries up well with kind of our communication tools with DQ. Sorry. In response to a question that was asked over here about who funds the thinning in operation, you guys, my understanding is you're regulatory agencies, and it's the uh, federal government, state government, does have funds available to thin, and particularly on their own lands, and uh, the landowner comes up with the uh, uh, funds to uh, to do the, the prescribed burnings, not the regulatory agencies. Correct, yeah. The thinning is, uh, thinning is on, if it's private land, it's on the private landowner. If it's thinning done on federal lands, it's on the federal land manager to get the funds to do that thinning. Yes, sir. So uh, you have jurisdiction on the uh, federal lands, too? Correct. And uh, what you said, you have a lot of lands. BLM, they're federal, we have jurisdiction on BLM. So you want to burn federal land, state land, and then yeah. The smoke management plan essentially applies to all forest lands throughout the state, except for tribal lands, so, instead of sovereign. So just this thing, you just added the call, why don't you just let people log or take the sticks out, get all this food laying down, and let no one more pick up their stuff. Fire 
after that, you can start to find it. But when you start to earn it, as a result of what you do, you burn, 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 control, burn, and you want to burn the whole forest yourself. How does that work? <coughs> we do not determine, our office, the Smoke Management Plan, does not determine when burning can take place. The landowners and managers make determination based off of the fire conditions on the ground. So if it's too late, they'll know when it's too late to burn and too dry, and they're not going to put a match to something that they're going to be fighting. It costs a lot of money to fight their own ground, <laughs> fight on their own ground in the fire. So they make that determination. But this all this wrong management started all this problem that we had 20 years ago. We have all these problems. When, when people, more people were doing the logging and, and grazing and control burns was in a reasonable time. But all this, you are part of the problem itself. That's my thing. I'm not sure if I understand any of uh, the You are the problem. I appreciate your feedback and the comments, and I think it'd be really helpful for you to put that on the record when we start the public hearing process so that we make sure and have it kind of documented. Sir? Um, I have an understanding that, uh, that the Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, allows the fire to get so large. This, this is from different people commenting on seeing fires in uh, men who work for the Oregon Department of Forestry who said they've seen fires on federal land and they can't go put those fires out. And those fires are allowed to get so big. Is that, is that true? Is the federal U.S. Forest Service allowing fires to get to a certain size before they'll fight? Yes. Is that the way they were doing it to start this fire season? Yes. That's a loaded question. I just want the truth. <laughs> That's all. So I can tell you from experience that in general, that ODF, since we are protecting private landowners for the most part, that we're the most aggressive at fighting fire. Now, thank you. Federal landowners uh, fight fire as well. They have some different concerns. They have maybe some little different values in what they're trying to do. They also are, uh, their land is also further away from communities and in more rugged terrain. So there's a number of issues that are involved in why they may fight fire a little bit differently. Now, I'm not gonna try to get into a political war on why we fight the way we do versus how they fight the way they do, but just recognize the differences in the areas that, whether it's a federal landowner versus a private landowner, what they're trying to fight, and why one owner may be more uh, concerned about fighting that fire more aggressively than another. And as you can see, the, the problem is that if you let a fire burn at all, it's a controlled burn. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that has a statement on that fact. And they've said, it's our land. It's we are Oregonians. And they, I understand that. And that was very well said. That was very, very, very well put. And, but the end result is those fires burn towards us. In the end, it's all our problem, whether it's small or big or all that, so we got to get on the same page here with that group and start from the very beginning and say, we're going to fight these fires this way, because they're all coming our way in the end. The winds blow west, on occasion they go, uh, winds blow east, and we, we get that, so I hope that they are going to do that. Can I just add something for this? Do you want to say it? We know, I, our deputy chief of forestry is, is here. We know the new uh, forest supervisor for the Road Siskiyou. We were just talking about him today. He has been fighting fires as aggressively as possible. The main limitation is they won't put firefighters in situations where they can get killed. But, but this guy has been doing that. I don't think we should shortchange the Forest Service when they aren't here to, to explain what they're, what they're doing. And I just wanted to add that the ODF and the Forest Service during fire season are in daily communications. So uh, we do fight fires jointly. We jointly make decisions on which fires get very scarce resources this time of year. So uh, for those decisions, they're not taken lightly. And the uh, decisions made fighting the fire and protecting uh, lives and values are highest priority for all the parties involved.
So I know we have a couple more questions, but we're running up on time, so I kind of want to take a poll here. We've got 12 people at this point who want to provide comment, and if everybody's comfortable, we can continue with uh, public with taking questions, or I'm happy to take questions afterwards as well. If anybody has more comment cards, please bring them up. We all so let's get thumbs up if you want to continue questions and thumbs. Can I just, if you want to do can I just ask a question about the process here? I thought this was over at 8.30. Is this going on all night or what? <laughs> it's going on as long as you want it to. I mean, is this a hearing? And this is a hearing. None of this has been open for, this, none of this is on the record as of yet. Right. This, we so haven't started the hearing start process. This is just been a question and answer session before we get started. So. Let's go ahead and grab a couple of these comment cards. I haven't seen those. If you'd like a comment card, you can come up and grab one. So let's go ahead and get started with the public hearing, and then I can answer questions in the back if you have more. Take a five minute recess here, we'll maybe get set up.